What's going on, everybody? Uh, it's Justin here with Tony today, and we are talking about a cool little fishery that, for those that go and do it, uh, are obsessed with it, myself included, at least for many, many years when I got into kayak fishing, I would specifically try to target this species. Uh, and it's tricky. And there's a lot of little nuances that go along with it. And in this video, we're going to talk about fishing for juvenile tarpon, uh, absolute ghosts of fish to find and get to hook. But when you do know that they're in an area and you fish for them, those of you out there that have had a chance to do it, you know that it can be pretty challenging. Sometimes these fish won't even bite a well-placed little finger mullet. And, uh, and other times when you find out just the right lure or work it just the right way, you can jump and hook some of these, you know, so let's say sub 20 pound, 10 pound or smaller tarpon. Uh, and it can be a lot of fun. And here as we come into the winter time, there's going to be, you know, little bays and residential docks and canals that are going to hold some of these juvenile tarpon. Luke has talked about it in the past where in the wintertime, he'll kind of poke in and around all these residential docks and find tarpon. And some days are willing to bite and other days they aren't. But as Tony and I are hopefully going to reveal here in this call, I think that there are certain lures and there's certain approaches to fishing for these guys that can increase your chances of at least getting that bite. Can't guarantee you're going to land them, but at least getting that bite. And that's what it's all about. So uh, what's up, Tony? How you doing, my man? Not much. Doing pretty good. Cool. cool. So uh, you kind of kick it off with saying juvenile tarpon. Tony and I are both here in Central Florida, and a lot of our expeditions and trips are over to Central East Coast, Indian River, Mosquito Lagoon. And there's not a lot of tidal flow there, but juvenile tarpon can be found over a whole chunk of Florida. I mean, I, I've seen them in fish form up in Jacksonville. They can be pretty common and abundant down in Southeast Florida, uh, over in Tampa Bay area. That area is huge. There's even resident tarpon in Homosassa and Crystal River as well, because there's, you know, freshwater springs that feed out and the water temperature stays in that low 70 degree year round. So it's, it's comfortable for a lot of them. But in the wintertime in particular, I think we might even break out this conversation into some seasonality. Uh, but where we're at right now, uh, you know, we're, we're in the middle of fall and we're going to come into some colder weather days here soon. And a lot of more juvenile tarp and not the big hundred pounders are going to start popping up in back bays, stagnant water areas, you know, culverts with with running water, um, deeper creeks that are that are very quiet and kind of off the beaten path are going to pop up. And uh, finding the right lure to present to these guys or even bait sometimes gets tricky. So, Tony, um, I kind of want you to take this away, man, and, and tell me your perspective of, you know, let's say for right now, we're in the middle of October and through the rest of October, November and early December, if you were to stumble, well, let's start with this. What kind of areas would you specifically look for if you wanted to fish for juvenile tarpon right now? So it's really those backwater, you know, lakes or ponds, whatever you want to call them that are off of the main, you know, bay or like Mosquito Lagoon, Indian River, Banana River, you have these small little tributaries that feed into them. And those areas usually will hold those fish, um, especially this time of year, you know, summer into the fall when we have a lot of rainfall, uh, when those fronts come through, they drop a lot of rain, those culvert pipes start flowing that's usually where those little tarpons stack up. You know, um, Merritt Island uh, Wildlife Refuge, you have a lot of, you know, dirt roads back there, backwater impoundments. Those are really good spots to look for those small tarpon. Uh, as it gets colder, that's when you want to look for those deeper uh, areas, you know, the same types of areas, but deeper because those fish will hold right down on the bottom during the cold weather. So if you have a little you know, I found tarpon in, you know, a ditch that's four feet wide, but it ends up being like eight or 10 feet deep. Those fish will hold down there in that structure. You know, a lot of trees down there, a lot of debris, and you'll see a lot of bait fish. And usually when you drive by those areas, you'll, you'll hear tarpon popping on the surface and you'll see them rolling. You know, one thing I, I think is important to note is, um, and people might not know this, these juvenile tarpon, they actually are while they're still Megalops atlanticus, they're kind of their own subspecies. There are certain types of tarpon that never really grow outside of that 10 to 20 pound range and they're resident tarpon. Like when tarpon spawn, the big migratory ones, 
Um, and their eggs release and make their way into estuaries and bays. And sometimes we have the migratory tarpon come through the river and the lagoon where it's not super tidal. They reproduce and those eggs make their way into mangrove estuaries and bays. And uh, when the tarpon hatch and they grow and they're feeding on everything, little, little glass minnows for the most part when they get to, you know, let's say big enough size, they'll stay in that area. And there are certain tarpon that just don't ever leave. They're resident juvenile tarpon and they, they max out at, let's say, 20 pounds or so. And for those of you that go out and fish for them, when you do finally land one, look very closely at their eyes. They're a little bit bigger in size and they're blacked out. They're kind of like bug-eyed tarpon. Um, they're, they've really adapted to the environment that you find them in, as opposed to the giant silver 100-pound ones you get off the beach in the summertime. This is kind of a little different variety of, of, of tarpon, and their behavior is very different. You know, and I feel like that was worth noting that when we go back into these areas and we fish for them, um, they do look a little bit different than the bigger variety that we fish for in the summertime. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll notice like a lot of the, when you do get into them, you're going to find a lot of the same size in the same type of area. You know, you're not going to catch a, you know, five pounder, then all of a sudden catch a 80 pounder. They seem to school up in the same, same size range. Yeah, for sure. So for right now, you mentioned that, you know, we're going to have some storms kick up. We're going to have these cold fronts start popping in. Um, when I started fishing for, well, when I started fishing out of a kayak 10 plus years ago, uh, I love tarpon. It's one of my number one favorite fish to go for. It was my number one until blackfin tuna, but that's another story. But fishing for tarpon is a ton of fun. It's like bass on steroids along with snook, but they're way harder to get hooked. And with them jumping like crazy, they can be a little tough to keep on the hook. So the allure of going for them, because it's not as consistent of a fishery as sea trout or snook, but when you start figuring out these back bays and really secluded areas, for those of you out there listening, take some time and in your area that you fish for, you likely have juvenile tarpon accessible to you. This is for the big chunk of Florida. I'm sure that there are some in some secluded bays in coastal Georgia and the Carolinas, albeit probably not as common because it gets really cold up there. But for any of you guys here listening, ponds, even if it's areas that have a lot of freshwater runoff, tarpon have no problem living in areas with low salinity. Um, they're urihaline, just like redfish and, and snook. They can live in straight freshwater, no problem. And um, in talking about the bait fish or the food source that they're eating, can be a variety of, of, you know, little glass minnows and any kind of killifish or freshwater minnow even it tends to be their, their main forage. And because of that, and the size of these bait fish, when you do see them or hear them popping, a lot of things that we have accessible to us as inshore anglers that throw soft plastics and hard plugs are usually bigger than the size profile that these tarpon are keyed in on. Um, so we're going to dive into lures here in a second, but you know, when you find them and they're keyed in on these minnows, that's kind of what makes this so tricky is that step one is locating these guys. We're talking about back bays. We're talking about deeper creeks as it gets colder out. Um, and But when you finally do find them and you hear them and see them feeding, even if they're actively feeding, they can be really tricky to get to bite. So over the years and with a lot of throwing the kitchen sink at, at these fish, Tony and I have figured out a couple different lures that we think can entice a bite and then the rest is up to you as an angler to bow and stay connected to this fish and that's a whole other part of this conversation but tony if you were to go out and specifically fish for juvenile tarpon let's say you have an area that you know they're in this bay or this little cove and you find them tell me three lures that you think would help you seal the deal instead of weeding out you know the 10 other plus lures you have in your box and Tell me like what three lures you would use and what weight size you think you'd want to match up with it. So I'll narrow it down to one lure. Because whenever, I'm, whenever I'm going after a tarpon, you know, the small tarpon, I have one lure and I make sure to bring it with me. It's a, a four inch white pearl gulp swimming mullet. It has really? that curly tail on it. And I'll put it on a one eighth ounce jig head, either red or chartreuse. If the water is really murky and stirred up i'll put it uh, put it on a chartreuse jig head if the water's pretty clean i'll put it on a red uh, jig head but that one eighth ounce jig head with the four inch gulp swimming mullet 
works really well. That's what I've caught most of my juvenile tarpon on. And um, what I like about those swimming mullet too, is you can make a little nub rig out of it too. You know, you can cut the tail section off and it'll make it like a little one and a half inch nub that darts through the water. And it really imitates a glass spinner really well. Dude, I never thought about that. It makes so much sense though. So when fishing for redfish trout snook, you know, a paddle tail in general is the go-to. Puts out good vibration, great power tool. You have so many different ways you can rig it and work it. But here's the thing, like we will still, I mean, you'll throw in the, the you know, the swimming mullet. That's different to me. That's a curly tail design as opposed to the paddle tail. And one thing I've, I've heard through the grapevine and I've, I've tried on the water is that tarpon don't respond as well to lures that have a lot of action to them. And by that, I mean, because I have a couple hard plugs I want to show, and that's that's different. Paddle tails in particular, I've gotten and, and have hooked juvenile tarpon on paddle tails. But if I'm trying to twitch this and jerk it all over the place, they tend to don't respond as positively. Like they won't come up and, and swipe and be more aggressive on, on their strike. They might be eyeing it the whole time, but might be you know apprehensive to commit and swipe at it. And I think a big chunk of that is because the paddle tail might put off too much vibration or you might just, you know, have a big profile to it. Even though this is our Slam Shaded 2.0, it's a three and a half inch paddle tail, still a pretty finesse lure, all things considered. But we're talking about taking it to that next level. We're talking about tweak things to help increase your chances at fish that are really picky. I mean, they're keyed in on the tiniest of bait. And a curly tail in general, like that swimming mullet, makes a lot of sense because you have action, but it's not putting out nearly as much vibration as a paddle tail. Um, that nub rig never thought about doing it with that, but I mean, that, that body profile of that swimming mullet, it's kind of short and chunky, like a little yeah. killifish or a little glass minnow you'd find in a back bay. Um, so I like that, that concept. I'm, I am probably have to pick that up for my, my back pocket lure now and try it. Um, another one yeah, I, I have, a, is, oh, I have a we, bunch of, um, insider reports for our insider members and you'll see whenever I'm catching juvenile tarpon, it's, it's on that little four inch gulp swimming mullet. I'm just intrigued because I've tried so many things and I've been successful with my own myriad of lures, but you were hundred percent confident. Like, Oh yeah. Like I, I can, yep. I can go out and seal the deal with that lure. So now I have, now I have to go try it. That's <laughs> so I'm excited and, about it. And what's more important, probably the most important is the presentation because I found that sometimes if you rip it across the surface, they will hit it. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes you have to let it sink all the way down to the bottom and just do a slow, steady retrieve up to the surface and they'll hit it. Sometimes let it sink to the bottom, do a fast, you know, ripping it up to the surface. They're very picky when it comes to that. It, you really have to play around with the presentation. Start slow and then start working it a little bit faster to see what they're dialed into. So talking about presentation, what I have rigged on here, if I were to just pop the tail off and probably not a bad idea here coming into my next trip. So turning, you know, like a slam shady into a nub rig probably will reduce that vibration, right? Be a little more streamlined, but I actually have a 16th ounce jig head. The, I like the eighth ounce approach because even if you, you're going to find a lot of these tarpon in a little bit deeper water than you would normally go for redfish and trout. They're going to be in four or five feet or deeper most of the time, usually sub 10 feet. So between four and 10. And a lot of times when you find them, they're on the surface rolling, they are popping minnows. So I try to work that top part of the water column. And that's when I'll want a lighter jig head. I'll want a 16th ounce because I want it just below the surface. But an eighth ounce, I think is a good universal weight because like you said, they could be mid water. They could be a little bit lower in the water column where you need to pretty much slow roll down across the bottom. Even though you see them on top, they may not be willing to eat on top. They may want to feed somewhere else in the water column. So the presentation and the weight that you're going to go with on a jig head uh, or a, a weighted hook, which, you know, I've got different setup there. Um, you know, knowing that depth control and finding that sweet spot that these fish are comfortable feeding at, it's kind of funny, right? Because you can see them pop on the surface and then we're throwing lures on the surface and they don't eat it. And yet we'll slow roll mid water and we'll jump two or three. So th they are, you know, there's not a whole lot of rhyme and reason to going for these fish. And that's kind of, kind of why we've broken away from some of the traditional lures that you use for redfish and trout and snook out on the flats or in mangroves. 
because they're just a weird animal they, they just yeah. they strike things and they behave so differently than everything else that we're used to fishing for and i'll i'll pay attention too to what they're doing on the surface like how you see them react if they come up and they roll like and they sort of turn sideways you see the side of their body they're usually coming up and then going straight back down to the bottom if you see them come up and sort of you know what a, i call it porpoising like when a dolphin comes up if you see them porpoising they're usually staying a little higher up in the water column right so so like how they're rolling right like their yeah. behavior on the surface we kind of call them like happy tarpon right if they have a slow roll and they seem to be oriented straight they're on the surface they're milling around they're hanging out they're comfortable but even for those guys that that see the bigger migratory ones in boca grande or at the passes when they're on the move and they're humping around they'll turn sideways and they'll roll aggressively and yeah. tarpon i think some might argue this but from my understanding tarpon are actually obligate air breathers so it's not necessarily supplemental tarpon at some point do need to come to the surface and gulp air now that time frame could be 20 30 minutes or more in between but they do come up to the surface and gulp air at times so their behavior and, and how they do so would determine kind of where to target them. That's a, that's a really good point. Yeah. That's why you can find, you'll find them in like those stagnant ditches in the backwaters where no water's moving, low oxygen levels. They'll come up for air, gulp that air. Yeah. A lot of the little ones for the most part, I do see them come up and roll sideways pretty aggressively. They, they, they just, and every aspect of it, they, they can be pretty picky. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll see them come up and whether they're popping minnows or they're just rolling in that manner, that sideways aggressive manner. Um, God, they're, they're just so hard to fish for. I'm thinking of a, a different approach. So you got one lure. <laughs> I'm looking at like six right now because every time I go for it, I'm, I'm throwing different things. It's not entirely a kitchen sink. I'd look at it more as like a smorgasbord. So I've got different things I'll try depending on how they're responding every day. Now I'm going to pick up that swimming mullet. But for me, I don't have the smallest one on me right now. But the smaller size version of the Mirror Lure Mirrodine, I think it's called a Miro Mini. And they make a Miro Minnow as well, which is kind of like the hot dog version, if you consider this the hamburger version. It's much longer. It's skinnier. Okay. The Miro Minnow or the Miro glass minnow is really, really small and much narrow in its profile. I think Tony's probably pulling up something similar. You got a Miradine right there, right? Or is that the Miradine mini? This is the small one. Yeah. Uh, the difference is like, I think it's maybe half an inch shorter, but honestly, when you're trying to replicate the bait fish that these guys are feeding on, tarpon in particular are so profile oriented they have big eyes and, and they're keying in onto their bait very acutely so dropping down in your presentation finessing everything in your approach you know could mean the difference between going out and just throwing five lures at them and never hooking up and throwing just the right lure right profile right size and getting one strike sometimes that's what it's all about um there's there's another lure that i have used and it works really well it's actually using a fly with spinning gear if you if you don't have a fly rod they sell these little plastic clear bubbles and it's basically like a bobber and that allows you to cast it out and then you put about three to four feet a liter or you know extra line behind it and that's where you tie your fly onto you can do the same thing too with you know a paddle tail or something tie a little teaser or a fly to it and they'll usually hit that small little white fly I like, yeah, that's the challenge is we always think if you are a fly guy, whether from kayak, from land, because you can find these juvenile tarpon in ponds from land, no problem. Um, fly is definitely the way to go in general. Like th the way that a fly looks in water, it looks different than anything we throw as soft plastic and hard plug artificial guys. There's no soft plastic and, and hard plug that's going to imitate the way that a, a wet fly or little streamer or nymph or what have you, whatever body profile you move to the water, it looks so weird out of water. And then you put it in water and you strip it and you're like, oh my gosh, that looks exactly like what these fish are feeding on. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, there's one that I thought of, Tony, that's kind of new and I haven't thrown it yet, but I want to check it out by a company called Bugs. Uh, Bugs Fishing is making these eighth ounce, 16th ounce, 
hybrids. It's kind of like a jig head, but not really a bucktail. It, it, I don't really know how to explain it, but it's like if a fly could be accessible to a guy throwing it on spinning tackle, they're kind of designing it in that way with weed guards and um, looks like a little woolly bugger or something. I mean, are you familiar with it? Yeah, they're, they're pretty much like flies on steroids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I bet that would probably work, work well. Um, and we're giving you all these options, guys, because Tony's got to nail down to a science. You might just leave this call and be like, cool, I'm going to go pick up some summon mullet and a jig head and I'm done with it. But, um, but I don't know. I, I want a couple more options. I think that I've been in too many scenarios where I've thrown different things and, I, and I've had different responses on different days. So covering the bases, we've got this finesse curly tail, you know, or even pinch down the curly tail to reduce the profile. We've got like a, a suspending plug, but smaller in size, like the regular Miradine could work. It does. I think what it is, is not just the size overall, because I mean, again, the regular Miradine could work. It's the flash and the pause. So it's this instinctual response to come up and smack something. And I've said this before on other calls, podcasts, things, when fishing for snook in particular, um, you can see snook all day long. You can see a school of snook sitting there and not eating, but cast after cast after cast after cast, getting the right twitch in front of the fish. Eventually, one's going to swipe at it. And you wonder why. Is that fish hungry? Probably in that moment, that fish is not hungry. That fish is responding out of aggression for, for another reason. Either they're frustrated the lures in their face or, I don't know, they don't like the, they don't like the flash. If a fish eats, in particular, a tarpon and a snook that you see, but might be not as willing to eat on the first or second cast, it might take 30, 40 casts to the same spot, they're striking out of something different than hunger. So it's this instinctual response. And I think things that key in and, and kind of play that cat and mouse game with those fish are flash and a little bit of a rattle, which you have both here in this type of hard plug. So sometimes, you know, my initial go-to because these tarpon will come up and swipe very quickly at a lure. Uh, if they if they can't get the whole lure in their mouth and they just want to go and kill it, I will keep the trebles on, but I'm starting to slowly swap over to single inlines as well because this may award you the chance to get bit, but I'm telling you, you get a juvenile tarpon next to the kayak or on land and they don't calm down. And it's pretty scary to deal with these guys with treble hooks. So while it may award you the chance to get bit, I am trying some single inlines on these type of plugs so that it's much easier on the fish and it's much easier on you when you, when you do get them landed and you're not having hooks fly all over the place. I've actually caught one on topwater, Super Spruik Jr. It was about a eight, 10 pound fish, but it didn't get hooked. The lure itself actually lodged in its mouth <laughs> like sideways. Like T-boned it? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, speaking of speaking of top water, I don't have a, a zero spook in front of me. I've used them before and I'll have a lot of them swipe and blow up at it and flip it in the air, but I've never gotten a lot to commit to the plug. So mix it up a little bit. I have, I think this is a small cultiva popper. Um, my there we go, my camera will kind of focus. Little itty bitty two and a half inch popper. And the idea being, if they're coming up and you see them feeding at the surface and they're not always going to feed at the surface when you're presenting your lures, but I will every now and again, throw a little popper out there and just, just little, you know, bubbles and gurgles on the surface and I'll let it pause and I'll pop it again. I'll let it pause. And sometimes I'll come up and it might not be a really aggressive strike. Sometimes I'll kind of nose up to it and they'll just suck it in right there on the surface. So a popper is kind of an overlooked, I'd say that's almost even a dying art amongst a lot of inshore fishermen. A lot of people don't take poppers out there with them because, because you have to work them super slow. And I think a lot of guys are comfortable throwing paddle tails and jerk baits and constantly being active, but poppers work and there's so many different varieties out there and they've been around for so long because they're, they have their place, they have their approach. You freshwater guys out there would probably get a big kick out of throwing a, a small popper or the guys that throw gurglers, you know, on the surface flies and just have that real slow finesse response on the surface. We're used to throwing walk the dog style lures because redfish, snook and trout, they like that back and forth and they'll chase and they'll pop. But I think a popper is kind of a different approach to that. And you stay in the strike zone for so long that eventually 
something this small gurgling on the surface, a tarpon will look at it and say, that's really no threat to me at all. I'll go over and pop that and see what it tastes like. Um, so that's another one kind of in my back pocket that I'll, uh, I'll try to have rigged up. Yeah, those tiny poppers. I used to use the Rebel. It was called the Rebel Teeny Popper or something like that. Yeah. It was super small. Oh, it's a, the Pop R. I think they're, they're, they're called Pop yeah. R or something. Something like that. I used to use that bass fishing, and I would cast it into pockets in the weeds, like a little hole or pocket, and just keep it there and just constantly pop it, pop it, pop it, and bass would come up and slam it. Like you said, you can keep it in the strike zone longer. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, what else do we talk about, dude? We kind of talked about areas. We've talked about lures and approach. What about the fight itself? Yeah, we could, we could talk about that. Um, I was going to say, talk about maybe gear, you know, leader line. I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions about that. So, okay. So for me, for, for setup, you can take your same inshore setup that you use for redfish, trout and snook out everywhere else that you fish. Um, leader size. I think that's that's debatable, right? So the challenge is we're finessing this approach and these fish have great eyesight and they're keying in on things before they go over and they strike. And the type of lure will help entice that strike, but you want to pre-plan for this. While you can go out with the same 10-pound braid and 20-pound leader, and for the most part, that works. Um, if you drop down to 15, while it may award you more strikes, they have pretty abrasive mouths, guys. When they jump and they strike, they're, they're going to fray you up the same way that a snook would. So I personally think staying between 20 and 30 pound leader is the way to go. But I have dropped down to 15 and every time I've gotten a bite, it's been dicey. I think I've probably cut off a couple times. I think 20 is the safe mark. What would you say, Tony? 20 is okay. I've lost a lot of small tarpon on 22. Every tarpon is different. Some of them, you you know, you grab their lip and it's super rough. Some of them, you grab their lip and it's like smooth. <laughs> yeah. So it really depends. Um, I would say 20 pound with possibly even like a 30 pound tippet on there just for that yeah. abrasion resistance. Yeah, you made, a, you made a good tip here recently talking about kind of that. I don't really know what we call that tip end. It's like the, the beefed up, the beefed up end. Yeah, right? we're, we're going to give it a, a real name soon, but... <laughs> I like that. Luke's talked about that for fishing for snook on the beach. I haven't put it into application yet. I think you said Peter Deeks does it as well when he wants to have a longer section of a lighter leader and then a bite tip it like, like what a lot of the fly guys do. And that makes a lot of sense because that is the, the strike end, but you still have a finesse approach with a lighter line diameter further up. Yep. Uh, kind of the best of both worlds. Yep. And another thing too, depending on where you're targeting tarpon, I've targeted small tarpon in ditches that are surrounded by trees. And I almost have to, you know, cane pole my fishing rod through the trees to present my lure. In that scenario, you don't have to cast far. You can beef up your gear a little bit. That way you can land those fish. I'll usually go with a minimum of 20 pound in those situations and, but still keep, you know, the leader about 20, 30 pound. You don't have to go too crazy with that. Yeah. I agree with that, man. Um, still staying on the topic of gear, while you can use the same, if, if we were to be specific for fishing for juvenile tarpon, and let's give it a weight cap, because a 20 pound tarpon is going to be different than a 10 pound tarpon, which is going to be different than a five pound tarpon. So uh, it, just like with redfish, right, you gear up a little bit differently, depending on the size in that range. Um, if we're talking about 10 pound tarpon, 20 pound leader, 30 pound bite tippet for rod. I think a medium power fast action rod is fine. Um, what my rods across the board tend to have a little bit of a softer tip. Anyways, I do a lot of open water fishing and I don't mind having a softer tip to throw lighter lures a little bit further distance. Um, I do sacrifice some on the hook set in terms of power with a light, a lighter tip, but when fishing for tarpon, I think that that, uh, that does offer me an advantage because when you hook them and they go airborne and you need to bow to that fish, if you have a really, really stiff tip rod, even if you go bow, that's all that's resistance on the line and when you're hooked up to the fish. So when the fish is jumping and you're bowing with a stiffer tip, I worry or my concern is that the stiffness of the tip might be that resistance that will get the fish to throw the lure. So even with slack line, 
Um, I, I try to have, you're always going to have a little bit of bend in your rod because your rod's going to be this pendulum effect when they're jumping. It's going to go up and down and wobble with that jump. Um, so I think a softer tipped rod, if you really wanted to be particular about it, the whole fast action, moderate, fast action, you know, the standardization is not the same between all these different brands out there. But if you were to take a rod out there with you, sometimes I'll take my rods that are six to 12 pound or even four to 10 pound test rated rods. And the, the idea being that you're not really whaling a hook set on these fish. Yes, they have bony mouths, but my view is if you have a sharp hook, these hooks are catching and finding a sweet spot in these fish's mouths. You're not trying to like crank a build ants hook set on these fish. It's not like fishing for the hundred pounders where you are trying to make sure that hook gets into a sweet spot in the mouth. A hundred pound fish and the boniness in the mouth is a different animal than a, than a five or a 10 pound tarpon. While they're still bony, having a very sharp hook can go a long way without a lot of pressure because sometimes it's just hanging in a sweet spot. So for rods, what I'm trying to say is I tend to prefer a lighter tipped rod and my hook sets are not Herculean, you know, the, the, I'm just getting it in there. Uh, and then I'm allowing the rod and that softness of the rod to be forgiving during the fight. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Also, it helps, you know, throw those smaller lures because you're usually throwing, you know, two to three inch lures. If you have a really stiff, you know, medium heavy action rod with an extra fast tip or fast tip, it's going to be tough to throw those really small lures. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so for the fight itself, uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit here. These tarpon are just absolute monkeys. Like when you hook them, they are crazy. They're going to backflip. And a big fish, when you go for big tarpon, they'll jump and sometimes they'll completely go airborne. But a lot of bigger hundred plus pound tarpon, half their body will still be in the water and they'll, they'll tail walk a little bit and their heads are just thrashing out of the water. Big trout will do that too. You, you hook a five pound juvenile tarpon and it's going to be like at the Olympics, Olympics where they're like doing four somersaults midair. Um, and they can, you know, tangle within the line itself. So yeah. we're letting you know this because you know that they're going to jump. This is just a healthy reminder that they're going to jump and they're going to be crazy. Probably they're going to make really fast turns underwater. They're going to zigzag. And a lot of times when you find these guys they are going to be in such enclosed spaces that you need to be very attentive during that fight because you can get slack underwater when you're fighting this fish. They can turn 180 degrees and run towards you. And if you're not reeling fast enough, if that hook isn't placed properly, they could just spit it underwater or turn the wrong direction. And that slack, they'll drop the lure. So yeah. they're a pretty frantic fish. Very much. I, I mean, I've had them jump onto the shoreline when I'm fighting yeah. them and just flopping on land and jumped into trees. And yeah, they're, they're a mess. You pretty much just have to hook them and hope you can land them. I, I would say there's no real finesse way to make sure you can land these smaller fish it's more of just hoping you can get them close enough to net them or get your hand on them yeah all right like we have this whole call about you need to approach them finesse but then when you finally hook them there's, no, there's nothing finesse about it you got to be <laughs> just nimble and on top of your game you know make sure make sure your knots are correct make sure you know you've got a good line to line connection the right leader it is really a system and going for these fish and we're getting excited talking about it because we know that when you do fish for tarpon, it, it isn't really like hooking any of the other inshore game fish that we talk about a lot. Um, it really is its own different animal. So, uh, I mean, that I feel like this covers a lot of the bases, man. We, we really talked about a lot. We talked about lures, talked about location. You know, I, I'd say for me, if I were to pick one sweet spot to go for tarpon right now, um, I try to find a, two things. I try to find a little bit of moving water. Um, and by that, I mean like culverts, like access points where water's coming out of a pipe and it's flushing a food source. Yeah, the same right approach on. you have for, for snook, I would initially want to look there for tarpon. And at the same time, I try to find a little bit deeper water. While I have found them out on the flats there in Indian River, um, you know, they tend to be scattered and I'd find onesie, twosie here and there. If you want to find a congregation of four, five, six plus fish, they tend to be in a little bit deeper water, let's say five to eight feet. Um, and a lot of times these back residential, you know, creeks and coves where there's all these docks lined up and it's just a labyrinth. Um, if you can find like a little area where water's dumping out of a pipe around somebody's dock and it's feeding with fresh minnows and it's a little bit deeper, 
I'd say that's my that's my go to location to find them. Oh, for sure. And yeah. but like you said, anywhere there's structure, usually if, if I find a creek and there's not, you know, trees in the water hanging into the water, usually won't find tarpon. They're usually right up in those trees. Yeah. And at which point it's tricky to get to them. But but yeah. uh, it's dicey. Um, Got to so yeah, right to the edge and rip that lure. Yeah. So, I mean, we can go on and on and on about this, but Tony, you mentioned that you have a number of insider reports specifically breaking down what you were throwing, the exact areas that you were fishing to be able to, you know, successfully get these juvenile tarpon. And to reiterate to you guys, we have an insider club that goes much, much deeper into this conversation. A lot of what's shared here is the approach and kind of the plan to do it as a general. But if you want to refine that approach and increase your chances of, of going out and being successful, chatting with Tony and I, uh, and getting a better idea on a map of what these type of areas are that hold these fish, we reveal all that information over to our insider members at saltstrong.com. You guys got to go check it out. It's a huge club. Like we focus on everything from what to use, where to fish for. And, and we're fishing with a lot of our members in the community as well. Tony's met a number of people over the years that they've come out and said, Hey man, I want to know how to go do this. And kind of what makes the insider club so special is there's times where Tony's like, dude, let's go fish together and we'll go grab a beer afterwards. Something like that. The relationships that we build inside that community is, is pretty tight knit. That's special. I don't, I don't find that anywhere else. So yeah. I think that's often overlooked in our, our insider community is the community itself and how cool and willing everybody is to help everyone be better, um, coaches and people in the club itself included. So guys, if you want to learn more about how to refine this and how to pretty much eight ball corner pocket going out and fishing for these juvenile tarpon, come join us in our insider club. You can, you get access to Tony and I ask us all the detailed questions and we will do everything to help make sure that you're more successful on the water. Definitely come check us out. If you're new to Salt Strong, just know that we're the best online fishing club for saltwater anglers, especially if you're targeting redfish, sea trout, snook, or flounder. There's nothing else like it. We actually guarantee that you'll catch more fish while saving time and money. We do this with our premium education, an exclusive insider community, and huge discounts on all the tackle that you need. So to learn more, go to saltstrong.com. Otherwise, we'll see you on the water soon.